Hello for another uh, chat about Book of the New Sun. This is the second in uh, the series. We are talking about Claw of the Conciliator by Gene Wolfe. Wait a sec, wait a sec, wait a sec. Oh. oh. I've got the hardback edition of what Philip's got. Um, I have a slightly older we, edition. <laughs> we chatted uh, four or five weeks ago about the first book, Shadow of the Torturer. Um, if you haven't read Claw of the Conciliator, you should probably turn this off and come back later because we will pretty much purely be talking spoilers. We will not be holding back. So you've been warned. And if you're interested in chats like this and you have read the complete book of the new sun and you haven't watched the first video, you should probably go back and watch that because I at least think we had a pretty interesting chat and uh, it's worth taking that in and then coming back to this one. So um, people on my channel probably by now know who I am, but who are you guys? I imagine everybody knows who Philip is as well. Philip is much famouser than I am. But um, in introduce yourself anyway, as if you weren't okay. a famous author. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> I don't know about the word famous, but uh, I am Philip Chase, and it is a pleasure to be here to chat with you, Matt, and with you, Paul, about this series, this story, the Book of the New Sun. I am... Looking forward to this actually very much because I don't feel a whole lot more sure that I know what's going on <laughs> <laughs> in uh, Call of the Conciliator. I know a few things. I mean, I can catch references. I, I, I know my Old Norse stuff, so I caught a few Old Norse things. And uh, I figured out, I'm pretty sure, who certain characters are, you know, and who they were and all of that. So I, I kind of sort of know what's going on. But I don't know why it's going on. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to this very much. And I, I find myself, though, intrigued uh, to uh, continue in this. So, um, But I am hoping for some help from the two of you today. So, so I'm Paul Williams. Uh, I am not a YouTuber, at least not yet. I'm sure that's inevitable. But uh, I am a PhD candidate at Idaho State University uh, here in Pocatello, Idaho, uh, just doing my dissertation on alternate history fantasy lit. I feel like in order to compete with, uh, with Philip's uh, most impressive uh, resume as a published author now, I'm going to push back a little bit or, or assert myself maybe. Uh, I was recently quoted in Paul Kincaid's uh, book, Robert Holstock's Mythago Wood, was my first article. My first academic right. article was about Mythago would derive from a chapter of my thesis. But that's neither here nor there. But that's just me explaining how awesome I am. Uh, yeah, but, so you're uh, I, you're uh, a quoted author. I am. I am indeed. Yeah, that's, that, uh, that tops Philip, I think. Yeah. There we Obviously. go. Yeah. But, yeah, so I, I've been a fan of Gene Wolfe since I started grad school. I read, uh, I read his Latro books about six years ago now. And uh, Book of the New Sun a couple of years after that. Uh, and, and like Philip, I, I found I, I'm curious if this is also the, the case for Matt. Uh, for me, Claw the Conciliator is the most bamboozling of the four. I think uh, now that might be because the first time I read this, uh, it was Christmas of 2018, and my family rented a cabin, and we all gathered at one spot, and all the nieces and nephews were running crazy all the time. And so trying to read this book with about 12 children under the age of 10. <laughs> Uh, running about might cause some trouble when you have ADHD and have a hard time focusing in the first place. But that, that being said, I still think it's a particularly... Yes, yes it is. Uh, but I think this is also very important. I, I, this one, the way I kind of conceive of the tetralogy is Shadow of the Torture just throws you in there and you're just confused the whole way through. Like It's just like yeah. you, you're, you're getting glimpses of things. I feel that Claw the Conciliator, you actually... You, you, you start to realize that you are somewhat situated in the world, but then you start to recognize how much it is hinting at much significantly larger issues. For me, sort of the lifter, the next book is, I just remember I had this light bulb moment where suddenly everything started snapping into place. And it's just a continuous, for me at least, it was an exercise of that continuous uh, linkage of points and, and uh, details throughout the rest of the, of the tetralogy. So I'll be curious to see if this... Uh, plays out for you guys as well. 
Hmm. And I'm uh, <clears throat> I'm Matt on books. You're on my channel, so people probably know who I am. My Gene Wolfe uh, credentials are: I am reading this series for the third time, but the last two reads were spread out over a thirty-year period. I think I read it the first time when I was in my 20s sometime, and then I read it again 10, 15 years ago. And I have a crap memory, so uh, a lot of it feels new, and a lot of the details in there are lots of details I have kind of forgotten. I, I mentioned this before. I bought this chapter guide, which and this is it's only a thin book, but it's sort of a, a summary and points out symbolism in the whole series. Um, and I, I just went through it because we had scheduling wasn't so easy to do it quickly. I think I read this four weeks ago now. Um, so I was I was refreshing myself. And like I just said, I, I just put out a video, which was like a, a month summary. And I said, basically, Claw the Conciliator is this more of the same what the fuckery as Shadow the Torturer was. Um, it's like yeah. the, what the what the fuckery gets bigger and in some ways even weirder and um, confusing in some ways. But the the feeling I constantly have, and I mean you kind of touched on this, Paul, was and it I would say probably through most of the series, I I always have the feeling that I'm reading about a thing that I know is. First of all, I know it's probably symbolic of something. It's maybe a reference to some other literature. I'm not as well read as you guys, I think. So I don't get those. I just know that there's more, but I don't really, I'm like, I don't know what the more is, but I, I, it feels like there's more. And I constantly kind of, I think out of habit, because fantasy as a genre is usually so explainy. I kind of, a weird thing pops up and I expect it to be explained. And it's yeah. pretty much not. I mean, it's the opposite of explaining. He'll yeah. put words in there that maybe they're archaic words or maybe they're made up, a lot of Latin-based words. There are, there are no made-up words. Okay, so they're, they're words. They're all archaic. They're not words that we use. No, um, no. And so you can't read that and know what that word is without that dictionary that you have, your Book yeah. of the New Sun special dictionary. Yeah. <laughs> so he'll drop these words in the middle of the story, like sometimes several per page. And you don't know yeah. what a, I don't know. Uh, what a cacogen. A cacogen. You don't know what a cacogen is or what it looks like or anything. And he doesn't tell you. It's like okay. he doesn't. He doesn't straight up tell you, but there are there are contextual clues. It, sometimes it takes a while. Yeah. Like the first time you hear yeah. cacogen, you're like, I have no idea what that means. I can Google it. Um, right. And even if you Google it, if you're not googling landing on a Gene Wolfe related source, right. it won't really explain to you what it means. But he's obviously uh, yeah. doing that on purpose. Jim yeah, Wolf totally. He's totally. doing this deliberately. And I, uh, when I read Shadow of the Torture, I thought, okay, he's he's doing something linguistic here. Uh, he's, yeah. he's, he's playing with language in a way that is actually kind of interesting. The, the point yeah. of this being, you're supposed to feel alienated and you're supposed to feel unmoored by all these strange words appearing. And I figure, okay, that that's that's deliberate on his part. That much I figured out. And I think he's he's questioning, as I said uh, in my review of Shadow of the Torture, the nature of language as a, as a tool for conveying what's going on in here. And he's he's questioning memory and uh, all kinds of other things. So that part I, I'm I'm enjoying, but I have yeah. to be okay with constantly feeling lost and not knowing what a cacogen looks like or what a whatever you know and and, and having these random it, it feels almost allegorical the way certain characters keep yeah. reappearing and certain characters are just by coincidence suddenly there and, and yeah you know, like, where are we going next with this it there feels are so weird. many strange coincidences like a medieval allegory yes. yeah. yeah totally yeah, totally. yeah. Totally. Do you do you yeah. know just just as a side thing? Do you know by now what a cacogen is? Not really. I mean, I, I'm not I'm not looking stuff up. I'm just reading the book. So. No, the the 
there are contextual clues. So there, I mean, not in detail. Like you don't, you haven't had one described to you. But if I, you, if I'm forced to define it, I'll yeah. say a cacogen is a member of a certain social class, uh, or has a certain role, I guess. Or it's not even a human. I think a cacogen is not is is one of the non-human entities in this. Cacogens are aliens. Yeah. Yes. And there are all kinds of alien plants and critters and stuff. Right. But yeah. a, but a cacogen is an alien sentient yeah. being. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what yeah. it looks like? I don't really know what it looks like. I do not think no. there's been anything like a description so far. We'll we'll get there. I remember. Yeah. I have a picture in my head what a cacogen looks like. So I know that it exists yeah. in the books. I uh, think that's in the next book I want to say. Yeah. Yeah, there is there is sort of a description. Not, of course, it's Gene Wolfe, so not a detailed and super clear description, but you can get a bit of a picture in your head. Yeah. So, yeah. so Paul, am I pretty much where I'm supposed to be now that I've finished <laughs> all the conciliator? I mean, I would say so. I mean, I, I, I kind of build on what you were saying, there you go, Philip. I think that uh, what Wolfe is doing, you know, it, he's he's taking advantage of what linguistic theory of the mid 20th century was talking about right where it's okay we have we, words don't intrinsically mean anything right. we've just agreed upon a concept of what they are but really like you never see like no two leaves on on even the same tree are identical the same way that no two applications of the same word are ever identical and so it's a matter of like he, he creates this web that we you touch upon a word and it's and, and again cacogen is simply the word that the translator of this text is using to approximate other things. And so we are actually create every image in our heads we have is inherently inaccurate because we don't even have the vocabulary for the actual things. But by creating this enormous like whirlwind of ideas about it all, uh, we start to approximate what it might be in our own heads. Um, but that requires us to visit and pursue and then revisit the text. It's a very recursive text. That's one of the trippiest things about, re about once you get to the end, A Book of the New Sun, for me at least, it completely reshapes everything that happened before it. Uh, but this is what Umberto Eco would call a net text, where every point of the text is connected to any other point in the text. Uh, it's not... It, most texts are, are unicursal. They, they move you a specific line through the through the plot and book of the new sun powerfully frustrates that having said that i want to uh, share a warning or, or a, a, a take so there's a guy on, on goodreads his name is terry a good friend of mine that i've met through goodreads he's a big gene wolf fan and uh he has this excellent paragraph in his review of a different gene wolf book the night uh but i think it applies here because we've all we've all acknowledged that wolf is so complicated and difficult and he's doing all this linguistic stuff here's what terry says uh, he says, let's see, I want to really be the one, quote, I want, really want to be one of those people who can sing Gene Wolfe's praises in the, to the sky and knowingly wink about all these complex and enigmatic stories that I totally got the first time I read them. But I can't. Don't get me wrong. Wolf is obviously a huge talent, and I like much of what he's done, but sometimes I just think he's more concerned with composing an elegant literary puzzle than he is with just giving us a good story. And sometimes I'm not even sure the supposedly complex literary puzzle is even there. I mean, have you ever perused some of the ideas and theories about everything Gene Wolfe has written that are on the Earth listserv? Which, if you haven't been there, is crazy. Uh, have you? I dare you to go and re wade through even one-eighth of them. Good. You back? Now, do you believe it? I mean, it's crazy, right? There's no way that anyone knows everything about everything the 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 way Wolf apparently does, and then codes all of those nuances into every word and punctuation mark <laughs> he's ever written, right? Right? Please say you agree, because I like to think I'm a pretty smart guy, but just glancing at some of those supposed references and subtext that Wolf appar is apparently making makes me feel like a total moral, close quote. <laughs> and I think that's true. I think we need to be very cautious uh, with, like, like, Wolf himself was always very caught off guard and, and, and a bit troubled whenever people would me at conventions and say yes I mean, you're referring to this as a uh, obscure medieval tradition that no one even knew about until 1994 but clearly you knew about it somehow when you wrote this and he was like no <laughs> and so we need to be cautious like on the one hand wolf is so elaborate and so incredibly intricate on the other hand let's maybe not overread the text at the same time there's there there's, are, a, there there's a lot of references in this oh yes like uh-huh 
you go through the chapter guide and, and then it's for one chapter, it's, it's like, this is connected to Proust in this way and relating to that character in Proust. And then in Beowulf, there's this and, da, 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 da. and then there's symbolism of flowers and colors. And, you know, and you're, I, I already, I mean, I'm not nearly as educated as you guys, but I'm not stupid. And I, I also started looking at it and going, really? <laughs> I mean, I mean, like you notice these things, author. That's yeah. interesting. But was was Wolf actually writing these things consciously? Well, some of them clearly, yes. I think yeah. some, some sure. Some yeah. of them for sure, because there are some puzzles in there that are uh, if yes. you like being a detective. For example, you know, it's fairly obvious that the waitress was uh, had been transformed by Doctor Talos. Yes. By whatever means into the voluptuous, uh, what was her name? Um, Jolenta. Uh, Jolenta. Yes, Jolenta. Obviously, too, I think that Dorcas is probably the woman who drew, who was dead. The, the guy who was looking for his wife. I'm who was paddling sure. around, around the lake. I'm and pretty sure she was dead. Because she came from that lake. We know that, right? Yes. Uh, so yeah. well, I we, like we, we Dor- don't know that super clear. Like no, Severian falls clear. in the water and she pulls him yeah. out. Yeah. But, but she has no memory of anything prior but, to Yeah, that. exactly. Yes. I, I, my my take is she was one of those dead people and somehow and she woke up yeah. probably because claw, of the claw. Yeah. Exactly. Because of yes. the claw. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He brought her out of there with the claw. Yes. Not I figured my on my own, I think, more or less, but yeah. And so there are things like that in there that, and of course I mentioned the old Norse stuff. So Gjold yeah. the river that separates the living from the dead in old Norse mm. mythology, or, and he also gets yeah. into giving us a little more, I guess uh, the background to this. So you, he, he plays around with Urth, Verdandi and Skuld, which is the, the Norns, right? The, the Norse oh, yeah. the fates. of the fates and yeah. Yeah. Um, Earth, which is, I think, Earth, U R T H is R E R T H in the future or something, but he also yeah. plays with it being the past because Urth, Urth being actually it really means fate or something like that. But we can we can call it past, present, and future. Urth, Verdandi, and Skuld, which he has fun playing around with with the various worlds, yeah. and it's more clear at least in this book uh, in the Claw of the Conciliator that we're dealing with a futuristic society with their spaceships and, and that yeah. something happened to put them in a more back to a more medieval state, at least some of the people, because there are still ships flying around up there that yeah. the elites still apparently have access to. Right. So, yeah. And I mean, yeah. um, what's his name? Volantis. He Vodalus. has a uh, Vodalus. Vodalus. He has a laser gun. Yeah. Yeah, you know, like all the way at the beginning of the book, he's he's shooting at people with laser. Yeah. Um, okay. So the high tech is but still there, but it's mostly yeah. unavailable and forgotten. Yeah, it's definitely very. Uh, and again, like, it's not even a matter. I think of like, oh, you have to be of a certain class, and then you just have access. I think it's like even if you're of a certain class, it's still hard to get access. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The 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 language thing that you were talking about earlier, like I. I said this last time we chatted, I don't approach things on the sort of literary analysis level at yeah. all, really, because I just yeah. I don't have that training. It's not the way I think. So I'm always sort of like, what's going on in the actual story is what I'm yeah. thinking about. But the, Which is the hardest thing to figure out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. But the, the, the language thing, I find it really interesting because what he's doing, I mean, he's, he's created a society that, at least in my take, is far future earth the sun is dying yeah uh i know that later on there are reasons the sun is dying so it's not really as far in the future as astronomy would at first yeah. suggest but it's very far in the future thousands of years and basically society has has rotted away you know like everything and and nobody nobody remembers anything anymore you know, like it's like post-historical. Mm-hmm. There isn't it's for really... all the people living in, on the garbage heap. You know, um, yeah. well, and for most of the people, unless you're like the curator of the library, like most people don't really seem to have a whole lot of access to history going back beyond their lives. Even you know, there's like weird yeah. myths, and I heard a story and stuff, but like real understanding of there used to be a, like 
they don't even seem to know that the towers they're living in are spaceships. Yeah. You know, and it's right there. Like you're living inside it. And using then all of these dead words, I, I know in the conceit of like Gene Wolfe is actually just a translator and he's approximating or whatever, that these aren't the actual words in the, the world. But by using all of these dead words, it also suggests to me this connection to like completely lost history because it, it, like, and he, he, he's been really clear about this. He did not make up a single word. Uh -huh. All yeah. of those words everywhere in the book are taken from words in, in lots of different languages that are just yeah. no longer used. Yeah. And that ties so clearly to the world he's created where nobody remembers anything. And we're getting all of these words, which we're acting like they're made up, but they're just words we don't remember anymore. Right, right. You know, yeah. it's, uh, it's kind of genius. Yeah. Well, and, and adding to that, I think there's the fact that every, particularly all of the, the, the seemingly fantastical words uh, and many of the more common recognizable words uh, are, are, are polysignifying, meaning that they, they, they refer to multiple things. Uh, a, a, an interesting example of this, and I think it's well. Okay, let me let me give the example, then I'll expound upon it. So, this book we are introduced to the concept of the Alzabo, which yeah, I will be curious next book how you guys respond. I consider it one of the like top three most terrifying things I've ever read. Like, I am legitimately afraid of this thing. You mean uh, you're not a fan of cannibalism and all of no, that? No, no, the actual creature. I know. The actual creature. The actual yeah, no, creature yeah. is pretty fucking terrifying. Yes. Oh, well, I haven't met them. Yeah. No, they, they talked again, about them. They talked about yeah, them. They, yeah. they can use the voice of people they've yeah. eaten. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're animals. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. But Imagine they, a, they can a talk. bear that can. But they used yeah. it's, it's some, like, you know. It, it has like, has like a, a secretion. Yeah. 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 Right? And that can they, be used. The idea is they eat the corpse. Uh, yeah. yeah. I don't know what they were doing in the beginning of Shadow of the Torture, right? Exactly. Assuming exactly. Right. Yeah. And uh, and, again, and this was this was referenced also in the library chapter in the last book. Uh, 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 Severian asks, he's like, he's like, I've heard that there's like, there's a there's a pharmacon that can be used to uh, eat the bodies of the dead and obtain memories from them. So this this is a very uh, it's very present, but also like particularly the first time through, it is hard to keep track of what the heck is like all this talk about that aspect. But, but again, it's, it's, it's that returning of, it's that union of memory and time, right? But what I wanted to get at was, so the Alzebo, like the name Alzebo comes from uh, a Arabic creature that is, I think related to the ghoul, I want to say. But the way that that symbol is deployed here uh, is a very dark, perverse version of the Christian Eucharist. Uh -huh. And so the Alzebo is being used to signify, on the one hand, a uh, terrible monstrosity, but also referencing Christian sacrament. And so those two references are being mingled together in interesting ways, which uh, I'm going to now go off on a bit of a tangent. But so one thing I think that becomes more clear in this book, especially, is the way that Gene Wolfe is playing with narrative structure. So in structuralism, the text is the full breadth of time of the story, right? So beginning and end, everything in the, everything contained in those pages is time, as it were. Um, and you can reorganize it however you want, and memory and flashback and all kinds of things like that. Uh, and this text starts to do a lot of, we start seeing more clearly this elements of like, of the chronicler Severian from the future breaking in and commenting on things. Uh, and we are seeing, I think, it, Maybe this is just just about me and my background, but you know what Philip was saying. There's this element of like this kind of medieval allegory at work, which is a cosmological structure that's happening up here on this level. But Severian, one of the weird things he's doing is, or at least that's that breaks with so much of a fantasy literature that you read is uh, that cosmic stuff up here is seems very divorced from the hyper localized events again we talked last time about how book one doesn't even get out of the city we barely get to the end of the city in this book it's taken us two whole books to get through a city on what is a fairly banal journey or should be and yet all these weird things keep happening and so there's this weird is there's a, there's a layer down here and a layer up here 
as well as a layer here at the very least, which is what we would call history, because Severian is claiming this is history, but also there's this post history, and all of these layers are, are intersecting with each other. And so, uh, events that sometimes events are presented to us and we're they don't make much sense at the ground level of, but they, I, if it once you get a sense of the larger structure, they could signify something at this level. But also we have to wonder how is that historical me layer mediating between the two? And it gets real. that's, that's for me, part of the joy of this tetralogy, but it's also, I think what really alienates a lot of readers. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just a beach read. <laughs> Definitely not. Well, it's, yeah. it's, you know, I keep hearing people reading Malazan, you know, saying, yeah, you have to be okay with not knowing what's going on here. I think that's way more true in Book of the New Sun than in Malazan. Yeah. You have to enjoy not knowing what's going on. Yeah. You have to enjoy, you have to embrace. Not just, not just relax yeah. and be okay with it, but you act, actually have to want it. Yeah. I actually think, well, I think Malazan's popularity is part of why Wolf is having a bit of a resurgence recently, because I do find a lot of people, and again, I haven't yet read Malazan. Sorry, sorry, Steve. I know I promised you back in 2017 I would. I will eventually. Mm. You don't um, want to piss off Steve. No, he's he's a fencer and I'm not. But yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, and he, he knows where I'll be next March too. So I'll be yeah. next once again. But uh, he may anyways. have a hard time getting his sword there. But yeah, uh, that's fair. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, it's Florida, dude. Like, <laughs> oh yeah, it's is, Florida. Yeah. No, nothing <laughs> is forbidden in Florida except you can for buy you swords know. on the street in Florida. Yeah. Exactly, but. Again, like, like a lot of people have actually, I've seen a lot of people like using Malaz and saying, if you like the the density and the complexity of Malaz, then try Gene Wolf. Um, I see that a lot on booktube over the past two or three years, yeah. and so I I feel like again, I think Wolf is a bit more ornate, perhaps, and and, and I think something we didn't talk about last time, but I, I kind of think it's worth talking about is Wolf wrote the whole tetralogy before he went before going to press or rather he he was, he finished the first draft of the full tetralogy at the same time that shadow of the torturer was in revision. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, Malazan obviously does not have that. Uh, few series get to have that. Philip actually maybe can speak more to that than anyone else uh, yeah. currently writing as far as I know, where it's the advantages of you've written the whole thing. And so you can actually polish things where you don't have to, wait until your fans catch uh, uh, something that's like, oh, right, I have to address that later on. Dang it. Like, you can catch those things beforehand. Do you have anything it's, to say about that, Philip? It's an interesting thing. And just quickly, it's an interest, really interesting mm. thing that's occurred to me before about indie publishing because a lot of people are doing that. You know, it's like, I've written a series, all of it, and now I'm going to put one out every six months. You know, but oh, I've, okay. I've written the whole thing and I've sat on it until I'm ready. Um, okay. and that's totally different than the way you have to publish as a like trad publish author. Yeah. I, I think there's a difference though, between everyone else and Wolf where I can say, yes, it, it's been cool being able to finish the third book then go back to the first book and put in a little bit of foreshadowing or, you know, that sort of thing. I'm doing that on a scale that is nothing compared to what I think Wolf is doing. It's, this is such a self-referential, uh, full of foreshadowing and, 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 and symbolism. And yeah, it's almost like, um, one reason that, you know, you know, about typology, right. Um, so it's, it's like, yeah, I mean, it's like in the medieval times, you know, a reference to, uh, they read the Bible, uh, the the Hebrew portions of the Bible, as being basically yeah. foreshadowings of what would happen in the Gospels. Um, yeah, so they saw the Ark, for example, as as a, a symbol of the church, you know, or something yeah. like that. You know, they, and they would see these reverberations of symbols throughout history. I feel like Wolf is doing something similar, and here on, and there's a lot happening on a very symbolic level. Oh yeah. And it, it, I feel like I'm starting to get a grasp on some of the stuff he's doing. Like he's a lot of stuff about the, the boundary between death and life, obviously yes. yeah. a lot about that. And, and the claw being a key, key part of that. I mentioned Dorcas a, a moment ago. Yeah. Um, um, but and the soldier that they meet in this book or that and he revives the, the, the yeah. one guy who had the thing fly in his, the nuptials. And, and his, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> And, and uh, yeah, so I think I find it very interesting. 
also creatures that have a different, um, obviously his buddy there who was hanging out with him until he teleported wherever, or, you know, yeah. up, he had his beam me up Scotty moment. Uh, yeah. What was his name? The guy he was, he was Jonas, Jonas, yeah. Jonas, who we thought was just a guy with a metal hook, but turns out to yeah. be actually more machine reverse. Than- yeah, yeah, reverse. It, yeah, so yeah. he's a, he's a robot with a fleshy face. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've never seen that before. No. no. Well, and, and and not just a fleshy face, but like you know, organic material was used Most to repair him. him. Like yeah. it, it's the fact that he's a robot that was damaged, and somehow organic material was used to as an actual repair. Yeah. Like that's he's not, just a, weird. he's not a cyborg. He's like a reverse cyborg. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, he's he's obviously come from he he's part of this big puzzle. I think it's not yeah. just. I believe Wolf didn't put Jonas in there just for kicks, right? I mean, it, it doesn't feel very related to a lot of other things that are happening. But, but I get. Did, the but did feeling, you get all of the history connected to Jonas? Exactly. That's where I feel yeah. like okay, this is beginning to form some kind of a picture here. Yeah, and also. The stories within the story. We had quite a few in this yeah. one, in Claw the Conciliator. Yeah. And I love that. I'm, I'm down for that. Oh, yeah. I love the idea of these. You got to look at yeah, nested clues. stories. How do these fit in the, the, the narrative of the present? And you have the, these stories from the ancient past, from the, bo- the book that, that uh, Severian is, is running yeah. around with that uh, yeah. he got from the sky. If yeah. you just, just a real quick diversion if you love nested stories you have to read the spear cuts through water by simon yeah. Jimenez. oh you're you're on oh the, my the, god the train there <laughs> fuck me it's yeah like i've never read more nested stories than, than spear cuts through water i i counted at one point and i was like i think we're five stories deep wow like the book is a story and then, and and also, it's changing constantly between first, second, and third per, per, person perspectives, like Ooh. constantly. Yeah, it's crazy. Anyway, yeah, yeah, no, it, it won the Crawford Award. Stories, and I was like, you need to read that. Yeah, yeah, it read the Cro- it won the Crawford Award at ICFA last month, and ever since then, I've been like, I want it's this. Good. It's it's really takes some getting used to because it's sure. nothing like any fantasy I've ever read before. Obviously, I don't like fantasy that's too hard to get into so maybe not yeah yeah i know it's it, <laughs> I, I know you only get into beach reads paul so yeah, yeah. maybe yeah. maybe not for you yeah but yeah, yeah so what do you think paul of that the these stories within the story is there anything yeah i mean i think again uh, uh most of my training is in narratology and so like i love uh texts that do this um where and, and they all do different things. I think all of them, I think their primary goal is to try and shed light on either some aspect of the larger story by trying to encapsulate the story, right. or they are trying to demonstrate Severian's relationship to that story. What I mean by that is uh, Severian is a character within a book, but he's reading about other characters in his book. And uh, because in a less elaborate text, um, lots of fantasies do this. Even even really good ones will do this, where they function pretty much just on the primary diegetic level, and we just take it as, as it might have like a single reference point. Wolf is much more so concerned, I think, about trying to understand how human beings, because because Wolf being a a, a, a devout Catholic, uh, and this there is the most popular readings of this text and ones that I am most sympathetic to are very Christian because uh, I myself am a practicing Christian. Um, but I also recognize how he's destabilizing those. But I think Wolf is trying to figure out if you actually take the ideas of what we do know about the cosmos seriously, and you believe that God exceeds even that knowledge by endless magnitudes, but also believe that, that in the eyes of God, humanity is significant on our very daily humdrum kind of ways. I think Wolf is trying to reconcile those two radically different scales of understanding of existence. And, uh, and so similarly, uh, just as Severian is go- going through in some ways kind of humdrummy things. Like we have whole chapters about him, like walking into the house absolute and just 
hanging out there, like not doing anything. Like <laughs> in terms of like of plot in the most commercial sense, this book is a, is a weird failure. Like it's, it's not even a failure; it's a weird one. Uh, right. Right. But uh, they these things take on some resonance as, as as you clue more and more into the story. I think Severian is kind of experiencing that himself as he reads uh, stories that also seem so detached from the scale of his life, but actually maybe have some resonance. And so uh, I think this is most interestingly achieved and I am thoroughly confused by it, but, but the play the at the play, end of this book. I was just going to ask, can we apply this to the play where you have this seeming Adam and Eve type yeah. know, figures in there? There's this origin story where I feel like there's still also there whatever roles they're playing in the play it's not stated who's playing what but you kind of guess who's playing which part yeah. right you can yeah. tell really who's playing which part yeah for the most part um, yeah so it's a commentary on the those characters as well isn't it it is i think uh and so the, you know there's this, there's the limitations right of human of, of mortal beings to apprehend you know anything on, on, on the eternal scale, right? And yet it's still, trying to, it's still trying to refer to that. And I mean, I think it's interesting that the play is titled Eschatology and Genesis, uh, yeah. which, you know, eschatology, which means end times, and Genesis meaning beginning times, which is a callback to the very first chapter of Book of the New Sun, which is resurrection and resurrection death. And, death yeah. and so in both cases, we're seeing a reversal, right? Because shouldn't death precede res res resurrection? Shouldn't Genesis precede eschatology? And yet there's this element here uh, of this hinting of in a sort of cause that there's, there's a cosmos at work, or at least a, the characters believe in a cosmos where if, if destruction can lead into, into creation, whereas we always think of creation into destruction, but really can that not be a loop? Right. As in Hinduism, there are the ideas of these and, four ages. And Buddhism. Yeah, yeah. The, the Kali Yuga, which is the age of destruction, which then there's a rebirth, and the, you see the same thing in Norse mythology. Yeah, well. yeah, Ragnarok. Not yeah. Ragnarok, where you know everything ends, but then there's a rebirth afterwards. So. And it, exactly. It, I mean, like in the in the story, it also in a way kind of makes sense because where we're at is destruction. Yeah, like the world is really close to dead. Yeah, you know and. Yeah. I mean, I know There's, where the, the story's going, but I think it's already kind of clearly hinted that, like, it isn't just going to happen like that. It isn't yeah. just going to be the sun dies and the world dies and that's it. Oh, there's lots of hints of rebirth. There's, there's lots. lots of hints that, like, the world yeah. will be reborn in some way. So yeah. The, yeah. the order of eschatology and, and genesis totally makes sense in the context of where the story is. Yeah. You know? It, it is Book of the New Sun, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the the name's uh, a spoiler. Yeah, it is. Uh, <laughs> it's just one of those weirdest things about this whole thing is, I don't feel like it's possible to spoil it. Really? No, yeah. No. Well, try and spoil Inception, right? <laughs> or yeah. like try trying to spoil an acid trip. You know? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I I could tell you all of the things I ever experienced back when I used to take acid, and it wouldn't ruin your acid trip. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, I, I think that tells us that that wolf is engaging us in a different way, right? We are trained, uh, or really least acculturated by the majority of the of the fiction we do read is follows very uh, a, a very like centrist sense of of uh, techniques and appeals to a very centrist, highly popular audience to one degree or another. Again, like even something like Malazan, maybe from what I know about it, does uh, certainly. Uh, curate its audience, we might say. Uh, it is not doing it on nearly the scale of what Wolf is doing. And, and like Erickson at the end of the day does want to, to have that strong entertainment. Wolf entertains you, but he's entertaining you by giving you a very different type of dopamine rush. Yeah. He, he, he doesn't seem to care if you, if you get into the book, you know? Like Erickson, Erickson has got, like you can, you can not get a lot in Malazan. Yeah. And you can fly through it and go, wow, crazy magic. Wow, big action. Yeah. Oh my God, that battle and the characters and, you know, and, and not get a lot of the deeper things and yeah. still have a great time. Well, I, but, I look for patterns is what I'm looking for in this, yeah. this storytelling. And for another pattern is, is Severian's relationship with the various women that he's encountering. Yeah. 
So we mentioned Dorcas. Agia shows up in the scene that Matt has chosen for our, our background there. Um, yeah. Agia shows up having lured Severian with the letter that is purportedly from Thecla. Was it, was it just me or did you think, Severian, you're an idiot. Yeah, of course. Like, how stupid are you? Yes, I can understand that you loved her. Yes, I can understand some sort of hope. But that should last for 30 seconds. And then you should go... Uh, maybe this is a trap. Yeah. I mean, especially since he just saw Agia, or I, I've been calling her Agia. Um, oh, yeah. He, yeah. He just saw Agia like five minutes ago, like earlier that day, I think. And then in the evening, he gets a letter. Like, um. What? Well, I- I mean, to that point, to that point, I, I think on the one hand, I think the, the most available and probably most useful reading of that is this tells us Sir, Severian is maybe an idiot. Uh, I don't know if he would deny it. Uh, certainly, I don't think his future self would. But I think and there's this element of. It gives us an increasingly clear sense of how little Severian, how, how little credit Severian gives to women. Like he doesn't believe that women can, apparently he doesn't seem to believe, to believe that women, I even do, a woman. I like, like, in the crowd and like, he yeah. just mentions it and then forgets her. Yeah. Like he doesn't yeah. seem to give, he doesn't seem to believe that she could be so conniving. Right. Yeah. Um, now yeah. perhaps this is where he learns that she can be that conniving and, and is that determined to get like, I could see Severian being like, you know what? Like, yeah, I, I, I killed her brother. She's angry. She's, you know, ha- has made clear to me that she's angry at me, but she wouldn't really try to murder me, would she? He could uh, have so- maybe noticed it in the first book when she tries to murder him to get his sword. Yes, no, but maybe. Like- but 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 she had her yeah. brother to help her, right? Does yes. he believe that she can do that by herself? It's amazing that yeah, he, yeah. he seems to fall in love with every single woman that he interacts yeah. with. So, I mean, he goes <laughs> yeah. from Jolenta to... Uh, Dorcas in a you know yeah. like boom boom and, and yeah. it's like he seems like just kind of like to put that out there within without any expectation of that yeah. there's something odd about this behavior. Yeah. Um, so. I mean, it's well, I, 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 I keep having to remind myself like when when I thought okay, Ajia is obviously luring him into a trap and he's being an idiot. Then I was also like, Severian doesn't really know much about how the world works. You know, I mean, he grew up in basically a tower that was his entire world and he without grew up women. With, without women and with only the brothers right. of the the order yeah. um or rather the, the women he has met are women who are the clients right the witches Which, well the witches and the clients yeah. yeah yeah and so he knows women are either mysterious woo or he knows that they are about they're going to, that they are going to be tortured they're going to eventually be killed and I'm going to guess that most women who have, who have reached the point of the autarch's wrath that they're going that that's going to happen to them uh, are probably willing to to beg and, and try to do anything they can to please the, the torturers to try and get out of their situation. And so the idea of a woman who has some degree of control and autonomy in her life is probably a very foreign concept. And this kind of brings me to what I wanted to say. You know, on the one hand, we can say this tells us about Severian. It also tells us about the world. It, like, if, if we believe that this world is credible um, in general, then, then this weirdness about how Severian approaches women suggests that this is a world that allow that, that that teaches people to think this way about women. Yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, it's a it's a kind of stereotypical medieval world where yeah, you know, women have certain things that they should be doing, have to do. Uh, but they don't really have any power in society. You know, what power they might have is sort of background, not public, not visible. Pretty much every yeah. powerful character or anybody who makes serious decisions in the in the books is male. Yeah. But Which, I mean, even I still yeah. thought, uh, Severian, you idiot. What yeah. are you doing? Uh, I, I, I remember. I'm going to be vague about this, but I remember when I read Citadel of the Autark, the last book, and there's a chapter that, on the note of Agia, it is a, it is a most, I remember like reading the chapter title and being like, <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and I'm just going to say that, and I'm sure that if anyone remembers that, it'll, we can revisit that 
in a couple months. <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting too how he, obviously Wolf has had at the end of Shadow of the Torture this very clever little translation note talking about translating from the future and he continues to mess around with chronology here by having the introduction of this algae man from the future that Severian frees, right? He's green and everybody. Mm, the green man. The green man, right? Which is a gar- definitely yeah. a mythological nod. Yeah, as I say, probably, probably rang some bells for you. <laughs> oh, big time. Yeah, yeah. 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 Sir Gowan and the Green Knight going back to the green man. Uh, yeah. Celtic lore. And it was a, yeah. Who is a fertility figure? Um, yeah. And, uh, associated with sacrifice, uh, you know, bringing new life. Here we go again with the revival, yeah. you know, uh, new life. Yeah. Um, so well, he just keeps putting in these these tantalizing references, I feel like. I just thought, how damn unfortunate. Like That's the guy from the you, future. You're yeah. a tourist from the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're just coming back to check things out and you end up captive in a carnival. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bummer. It's a real No, bummer. I also I also got some of the symbolism, but I, yeah. I was just like, oh man. That's Which, your that's your time travel trip gone wrong. Well, that reminds me of a uh, a common uh, note people make about Octavia Butler's novel Kindred is that the time travel romantic uh, like capital R romance of, of an adventure in time travel is very much a white male power fantasy because if you're a woman or a person of color and you time travel to the past, uh, oh, good. Yeah. It, it, it's not it, it's not a fun adventure you you're not going to be rallying kings to your aid you know this isn't you know like like uh, connecticut yankee or anything like that like you're yeah. going to jail or to a plantation or something worse and yeah. uh wolf actually does seem to key into that um here and, and you know kindred was Kim was published in 79 and uh book of the sun was was being finished at that around that time so i don't think he was actively taking on that i think he just tapped into the same idea yeah. but I, I do like how the green man you know does make us this promise right he said he tells the he says day is brighter in my age and he tells us he's from the future and so there's yeah. again this this uh, promise and if, and if we if we keep in mind that the text on a, on a macro level is presenting itself as fantasy so this is not just a promise it is prophecy hmm. yeah um but that also kind of brings us to something I want to talk about uh, with, when they meet uh, Hildegrin and uh, at near the end of the book. Well, my goodness, uh, Hildegrin keeps coming up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, who I, I, I'm guessing is probably a reference to St. Hildegar, who I've only read a couple paragraphs from. But because um, all the char- all the major characters are actually references, their names are all references to Catholic saints. Um, but... This is page 405 in my copy, which I think is a bit, I think I have slightly different pagination from you guys. But she says, uh, so the young witch nodded, all time exists. That is the truth. Be- that's the truth beyond legends and epics tell. If the future did not exist now, how could we journey toward it? If the past does not exist still, how could we leave it behind us? In sleep, the mind is encircled by its time, which is, by- which is why we so often hear the voices of the dead there and receive intelligence of things to come. Those who, like the mother, have learned to enter the same state while waking lives surrounded by their own lives, even as the Abraxas perceives all of time as an eternal instant. And so first of all, like, just reading that, I was like, man, that's so, that sounds like almost Le Guinian, which I'm always happy to see. Uh, but like, like, what I love is how that, that works both on this like, philosophical, metaphysical, like, oh yeah, you know, that, that's a way to conceive of, of reality. But let's not forget, this is a world where women who were dead and in a lake can be revived and memories can be consumed and la- and like lash themselves onto the cerebral cortex and you know robots can be repaired with human flesh like how real is this and how metaphysical is it yeah and people can be brought slippage. back from the dead by a by a rock yeah, yeah. i love the slippage of identity because there are moments there where severian after he goes through the ritual and, and has the mm-hmm. uh, it's of, of imbibing both literally and metaphorically Thecla. Uh, yeah. And there are scenes where it's not clear who's remembering stuff or where he's, yeah. her memories are clearly informing 
him. Yeah. Like he, mm-hmm. When he escapes from the uh, the place in uh, I forget what the, the particular room was called, but where he was imprisoned yeah. with the people who yeah were, uh, the antechamber, the I think? antechamber. yeah the antechamber yeah. that's it yeah, yeah. And, and it's her memories that gets him out of there right yeah like, but there's this yeah. constant like and I love the slippage of identity this is another thing that Wolf I pretty sure is is trying oh, to yeah. fall into it super strongly reminded me just partially because I just finished reading um, Farseer trilogy by Robin Hobb oh yeah it really strongly re- reminded me of how have you have you read Farseer Paul. Oh, uh, I have. I've read Assassin's yeah. Apprentice, but I remember very little of it. Yeah, I know. I know Philip's a fan, but I, I wasn't yes. sure if you've read it. I won't super spoil anything, but there's there's a, a, a magic called the skill. Yes, and the main character Fitz has the skill very strongly, but he has no control over it. Yeah, and he almost becomes other people in his dreams sometimes. Yeah. And Robin Hobb occasionally has these super, at first, confusing chapters <laughs> where you're like, oh, we're, I thought this was a first-person narrative about one person. And all of a sudden, we're getting somebody else's perspective being told in a yeah. first person. And what's going on? And then you realize, oh, it's Fitz. You know, it's Fitz yeah. in that person. And they're, they're mixed in a really strong way. I, yeah. I, loved, I loved the way she wrote that, and I loved the way... Uh, Wolf wrote that as well, where it's like, yeah, yeah Thecla, Thecla is, is there. Yeah. In a way. Which, yeah. And so, you know, last time I, I, I mentioned that I, I have reasons why I think the potential slippages and contradictions in, Saber- in Severian's memory are maybe more complex than just he's writing propaganda. Yeah. I think, I, and I'm going to be slowly building this. I'm going to be slowly hinting at my case until we get to the last book. Yeah. But uh, I think that, you know, we, ha- we now have an in-story reason to suggest that Severian's memory is unlike ours. <laughs> although although there, was, there was one that I thought was really weird. I, I also had that thought, like, yeah. you know, he's, he's not just him anymore. Yeah. So, of course, his memory's at, at the very least weird. Right. Yeah. But one of them, one of them that stood out to me Numerous times up until the Alzabo, um, Thecla's scent is referred to as the smell of burning roses. Hmm. And then sometime in there, he he describes her scent as lilacs warmed by proximity to a fire or something like that. And you're like, lilacs and roses smell pretty different. Hmm. And you were in love with this woman. And hold her up as like the, the most important woman ever. And you would forget how she smells, and describe it differently. Though you have a perfect memory. <laughs> Although you have a perfect memory, or at least tell us constantly that you do. Yeah. Well, I, I, I feel like also something that seems to be emerging here in Claw the Conciliator, is that Severian is not just being watched but that all of this might be some kind of test that he has. I don't know, because I'm just going, I'm the, I'm the newbie here, but it, yeah. it feels like people who are watching him know something about him that he doesn't know, like about his identity. And, and given the fact that he is in the present, the narrator writing this is he is the Otark he has claimed. Yeah. And the fact that the Otark seems to know him and who he is when he meets him. <laughs> The Autark looked like he was waiting for him and was pretty like, much waiting for yeah. him. So you need to be Autark, no problem. Yeah, yeah. So it feels like a lot of this is just sort of him being set up in a way. Yeah, but possibly, right? Like the whole thing is a play, almost. Yeah, exactly. Uh, again, like, I mean, like it's a very I mean, related in, story as we relate to this. <laughs> quite, quite early in the first book, it turns out in this book that the Autark was the one who gave him the Thecla clone to sleep with. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, yeah. okay, so you've been there the whole time, kind of. Right. Yeah. Right. But why? Right? But why? Exactly. Uh, this, uh, book, uh, this book says, I don't care if you have that question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm not it's, interested. It's, it's, yeah. And again, and, but again it's, it's an important question, I think, because of the fact that you know one of the 
I think, subtle, but I think important things we can take from the first book, right, is that the Torturers Guild are actually super relegated. Like, most people, like, tortures are more rumors than, than reality. And Severian is, you know, a bit... A bit uh, he, he experiences some fragility over reckoning with that because he want, he's wanted to believe that the torturers, you know, that was his world and that was to be everyone's world. We're important. And finding out... Yeah. And then finding out, no, no, he's not. But he does uh, get employment everywhere he goes. He does. Right? He does. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. he, he, he's able to do a job that no one wants, right? But, you know, there's plenty of jobs we don't want. And so we like, we, we, we unsee the people who do it, right? right. We, 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 we like, how many people do you personally know that who are actual, who are garbage men, right? I don't. Uh, I mean, I say hi to them. But, you know. Yeah. Well, when I see them, yes. But like, I don't know any, of the, I don't know the names of any of them, right? Right. Uh, but I think, you know, to, to Philip's point about, you know, if this is a test, or if there's at least some sort of cosmological play at work, um, kind of like, what's the value of that? And I wanted to think about um, when the scene when Severian does partake of Thecla's flesh, uh, which, it's funny, so I read this first time back in 2018, and then it was in 2021 was when I first read Dune, and now as I think back on this particular passage, I one of the most bamboozling things ever in dune is the, the first time that paul is given like a, a meal with spice by the fremen and has his first like full-blown uh melange trip right so this is this is from the very end of chapter uh 11 uh but and he says just when i despaired she was there filling me with a melody uh, as a melody fills a cottage i was with her running beside the the Asus when we were when we were a child. I knew the ancient villa moated by a dark lake, the view through the dusty windows of the uh, Belvedere, and the secret space in the odd angle between two rooms where we sat at noon to read the, by candlelight. I knew the life of the Autarch's court where, uh, where poison waited in a diamond cup. I learned what it was for one who had never seen a cell or felt a whip to be a prisoner of the torturers where dying meant what dying meant and death. I learned that I had been more to her than I had ever guessed, and at last fell into a sleep in which my dreams were all of her. No, me not memories merely, mem not merely, mem not, bleh, not memories merely, memories I had possessed in plenty before. I held her poor, cold hands in mine, and I no longer wore the rags of an apprentice nor the fulgen of a journeyman. We were one, naked and happy and clean, and we knew that she was no more and that I still lived, and we struggled against neither of those things. But with woven hair read from a single book, we talked and sang of other matters. And so, like, this is not just a matter of, like, Severian has a filing cabinet in his brain. Like, oh, here's the Thecla part of it. Like, there's a complete fusion of identities. And then uh, chapter 14, the antechamber, the second paragraph, somewhere among the swirling worlds I am soon to explore. So this is future Severian interjecting. He says, there lives a race like and yet unlike the human. They are no taller than we. Their bodies are like ours, save that they are perfect and that the standard to which they adhere is wholly alien to us. Like us, they have eyes, a nose, a mouth, but they use these features, which are, as I have said, perfect to express emotions we have never felt so that for us to see their faces is to look upon some ancient and terrible alphabet of feeling at once supremely important and utterly unintelligible. So there's kind of like some, some Platonism here, like the idea of forms and shadows, uh, possibly also some references to like Paradise Lost when the angels are, when the angel Raphael is trying to teach Adam about angels are like humans, but we're different from humans as well. And that's the boring chapter of Paradise Lost, but it's still there. It is and, really boring. <laughs> but chapter nine is amazing. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think there's, again, there's, there's this element of Severian's not just, you know, updating his brain. Like, his being is shifting in, important, or in ways that could be important. Was. Yeah. yeah. And uh, again, like, like, you know, we can talk about, you know, uh, any Bildung's Roman, you know, as a character is no longer the same person, you know, Herodotus, right? You know, we never walk through the same river twice because we're no longer the same person, no longer the same river. But it's not just metaphorical, like there's some, there's a literal mutation happening to Severian's personhood. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> wow. Uh, 
So whose brain is broken? <laughs> oh, mine. I just want to comment, uh, Paul, that your shirt. All I can see oh, yeah. is the let's eat kids part on the top. Yeah, the, the one with the comma is the one we <laughs> that people need to see. <laughs> yes. Oh, and then it's the, uh, here, I'll do the whole. Oh, now I have the full context. Punctuation saves yeah. lives. <laughs> yeah. Christmas so present for my sister. The whole time was just the top one. So I wanted to make sure people knew that you're not a cannibal. Oh, <laughs> oh I wasn't planning about how appropriate to wear this shirt when we're talking about the Alzabo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, all right. Well, yeah. my brain is broken, but I'm, I'm having fun with a broken brain. Yeah, absolutely. I am very excited for the next book. The next book, I think, reads much more straightforward on terms of plot. And again, for me, that's where things click together. Okay. Uh, I'm yeah. holding you to that. Paul. Start to click together. I, I'm not going to pretend. Like, so, for instance, Jonas, I still don't understand Jonas. I know that Jonas is actually a huge fixation for the, uh, for, the, for, the, for, the, for, the for the hardcore Wolfians which maybe someday I'll be one of them. But uh, like I, I was Googling around about like I was like, what about Jonas? And it's like, oh, Jonas could be this, that, and the other. I was like, what? Well, we know why he didn't eat Thecla because it wouldn't have worked for him, right? Yeah. He, ca he can't eat. I, I mean, mean, did you did you guys get the, the whole history thing when he becomes kind of comatose in the antechamber? I did not catch that. Um, the history so, what do you mean by the history thing. What what I what I kind of pieced together of the history thing. Um, they have a conversation with uh, a couple of people in the antechamber, and yeah. they mention Kim Jong Sung or the, uh, something like that. It's like a Korean name, hmm. and yeah, they I mention that that is an ancestor of theirs. That they've been in the antechamber. Yeah. For generations. Oh, yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. Okay. And as yeah. soon as Jonas hears that name, he kind of shuts down. Yeah. Like he's okay. just leaning against the wall and he starts spouting some really weird, out of context sounding kind oh, of yeah. stuff. Right. Yeah. There's an etymological right? thing going on with that name. Like it's being, mis right. it's being misunderstood in the present, but it's clear to him what that name was. Yeah. He recognizes that name as someone who was on his ship. Yeah. Right. And he, I mean, my, my take on uh, like, especially like him teleporting away, why he did that is he's been out in space. He was out in space and because of relativity, he came back to an earth where they crash landed because they couldn't land anymore. Right. Yeah. There was no spaceport anymore. Yeah. I'm, I, I kind of assumed that the spaceport was the Citadel. That's why the, the towers, which are rockets. Mm are there, but that's not specifically pointed out, but it's kind of a guess. So they come back after they've been gone for who knows how long, but long enough that anyone who ever knew even about them has been dead for hundreds of years, right? Yeah. So he comes back to a world where he doesn't belong yeah. at all. Everything in the world that he left is gone and changed. And he kind of suffers along for a while, but when he gets an opportunity to go back to space, He's gone. Even though he has no idea what exactly it's going to do, he's like, yeah. I'm out of here. You know? Yeah. I'm, I'm taking off because the, the people who've been in the antechamber were the clear, clear signal to him. He's like, it's so over. Like the yeah. people that I knew were the ancestors seven generations ago of people who are trapped in this room, which yeah. used to be a waiting room to go see the autark. Yeah, you know, yeah. and now it's a prison, and they don't even yeah. understand anything related to me yeah. or my world. You know, yeah. exactly. Well, and it also raises questions like you get relativity. So, so time, more time has passed, and so they come back, and there's nothing there. But it's like, how does that actually happen, right? How how does something happen that you that well, like, did no one uh, write kind of you know a note saying, hey, by the way, you know, we we know there's X ships out there and they're, they're scheduled to arrive at this time um, in this 200 years from now make sure you're ready for them um and, and there's this is I, I hadn't caught this before and and matt you've got me thinking about things that i'm gonna i'm not gonna expound upon right now because i think it requires the next book to really go into but uh i i'm having thoughts about like kind of like just the suddenness and the, the fact that what should have been a welcome space something happened over 
uh, in terms of how history moves very suddenly became un, uh, unwelcoming to them. I mean, that's um, also, that's also to me with time and history and culture yeah. and all of that. That's one of the main themes of the book is that yeah. if enough time passes, yeah, everything's gone. Yeah. You know, well, or at it, least, at least the understanding of everything is gone. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You, you began as it began as a waiting room and now it's a prison and no one actually formally did that. It just did. Right. There's uh, a guy, also, there's a guy in a, in a gray desert with a white armor and a gold visor. Yeah. Some warrior, and, you know, yeah. it's like, well, it, yeah, I, could, I mean, kind of. Yeah. But, and so everything, everything changes and everything stays the same simultaneously. Right. Yeah. Uh, Ah, uh, I love like, these are the kinds of things I love about Book of the New Sun. I mean, you could you could we could talk all day, you know. We There's could, the guy who who's cleaning the uh, the paintings and and stuff. Yeah, who the heck is he, and how does he get from <laughs> how does he get from the Citadel to the uh, the Otarks hangout place? I mean, did you did yeah. you did you pick up on on his sort of holographic nature? Hmm. He, I mean metaphorically holographic he's not actually a holograph uh -huh. um he remembers multiple times cleaning a painting of himself right you know yeah. and, and he was just a boy, like this... apparently yeah. yeah 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 but he's also i mean he's he's been cleaning paintings for so long that he's cleaned most of them more than once like how old is this guy when did he start yeah. cleaning paintings yeah and he's yeah. never done anything else in his entire life, apparently. Yeah, it's true. I also think, there's a, there's a uh, lot of people like that. There's there's all uh, like the curator in the in the archive is also kind of yeah. like that. Right. You're just like they exist to do one thing, and, that's and they it. just show up out of nowhere. That's it. You know. Yeah, and then disappear yeah. again. Yeah, you know? which again lends to that kind of medieval take on things, right? You guys have any, you guys have any thoughts about the uh, the appear just the the I would say perhaps obvious symbolism or, like the fact that, that mirrors and labyrinths are obvious symbols. I'm not saying that, this, that what they symbol symbolize is obvious, but the fact that I think it's pretty obvious that those are two major symbols, which I would say Wolf is far away from board haste. But I'm still like trying to figure out what Wolf is specifically doing with them. Like we have Father and Neri's mirrors, which the only thing I can think about with those is there's the there's a famous board haste quote where he says. Uh, Procreation ha has a shares an interesting relationship with mirrors because they're the only two ways of of uh, doubling a species. Hmm. Yeah, I think it has a lot to do with identity, perhaps. Yeah, and where identity comes from, how it's handed yeah. down, and how it's um, brought into the future. Uh, yeah. So I, I suspect something along those lines. Probably. There was also. I'm not going to be able to remember it exactly, but in the, I, I'm pretty sure it was in Shadow of the Torturer. There was a little discussion or description of yeah, Father, Father Nero's mirrors, mirrors, right? Mirrors, and that they they reflect each other to the yeah. point where they bring something that isn't in reality into reality. Yeah, something like that. Mm. Yeah, because 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 that, that's how Jonas teleports, right? Is yeah. he uses he Father and Nero's mirrors in between the mirrors? Yeah, yeah. And I do wonder now. There, like now that I'm actually talking this out and thinking about, uh, you know, through the looking glass, right? It, the mirror is is an, is an alternate world. Um, and so I wonder if you know, here, here Wolf is using mirrors as transportation to, between realms. And is it are they transporting between just different locations? Are they transporting between imitations of the same space? Are they transporting through time? I'm not certain. But I do think that there's something happening there, uh, kind of looking glass stuff. There, there's also the really weird. I mean, that was that was actually just sort of as a scene, one of my favorites, the one where Severian is looking at a really large painting, and he turns around and backs up and ends up in the room in the painting. Right, right. And when he turns yeah. away from the wall, the painting, the hole that he came through is no longer there, and he's in a yeah. room with the Otark. Right. Somehow. So then, is it actually? And then, is it, and then really also, the, ro the room that he's in is an optical illusion built to look like it's flat perspective. Right. Yeah. It's explained in mechanical terms, which I did not at all buy. <laughs> no, oh, no, no. The Autark's bullshitting him. I mean, yeah. that's that's clear. Like, oh, yeah. that was just a door that closed behind you. And no, 
I'm pretty sure it wasn't. Yeah. I think yeah. it was also one of Father Inere's mirrors in some way. And yeah. He walked through it and was teleported into a room. Exactly. You know. And so there seems to be something, again, like, like, there's this, like, on the one hand, it's identity, but on the other hand, it's also, like, a very real tactile thing in the story. Uh, and of course, you know, the House Absolute, I, I remember when I was reading this, and uh, the first time I, I was reading the House Absolute, I was like, this is Gormenghast. I haven't even read Gormenghast, and I know that this is Gormenghast. And then, <laughs> If you, uh, there's actually a uh, a letter in the book uh, Castle of the Otter where Wolf talked as much as SEC wrote about writing Book of the New Sun, and he says he w- he was actually reading Gormenghast by Mervyn Peake while writing Book of the New Sun. Okay, that explains uh, which, a lot. Yeah, I've had Gormenghast on my shelf for years, and that's like a priority read for me this year. So read at least the first one. I I'm I've also got it on my shelf, and also yeah. like it's really something I should have read. Yeah. Yeah. So one other final uh, for me, just point of clarity. Yeah. The the Otark seems to be in a position of authority, but not unchallenged. In other words, I think the some of these upper level, like the exultants or whatever, yeah. they're not really completely under his orders, are they? There, yeah. there seems to be some friction, in other words, there some some power struggle going on, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, I would say that. On the one hand, it's, there's right it, Severian in the last book had this opinion that the autarch is this absolute, and you know, and then the exaltants are right beneath him, and it's this happy, copacetic, wonderful social ecosystem, and human beings just everyone knows their place and goes where they're supposed to go, right? And Severian is, is you know, it's boy meets world. He's discovering that things are complicated, and uh, like allegiances are political ex- uh, exigencies, right? Not uh, fixed loyalties. And so we have, uh, and, and Vodalus gives us uh, so some clues, right? That mankind once was a seafaring people mm-hmm. and uh, something has happened, right? That's, that's why I said like, it's interesting about, you know, the importance of the fact that Jonas comes back and there's no spaceport. Something has happened to cripple humanity's seafaring days. And for Jonas, uh, not for, for, for Vodalus, like the goal is, we're going to dig up the corpses. We have found a way to, to we've harnessed the algebra analeptic and we are going to dig up old technology so that way we can rise up and crush the autarchy that, that, and we're going to crush the Ashians and we will once again reassert mankind's dominance. And we're so, so it's that they're going to make earth great again is what they're going to do. Right. And is his goal. Yeah. There's right. there's also a couple of points where it's mentioned in terms of Vodalus, but also I think right at the beginning, Severian and Jonas have a conversation about the wall and the, mm. the creatures in the wall. Yeah. And yeah. while they're talking about that, they mention Abaya and the mm. other uh, giants. And, yeah. And, and at some point, Abaya comes out of the water and speaks to Severian. Was that a Baya or was that one of the? Um... I'm not sure if it was a Baya it, it, herself. It, 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 I think it's it a Baya or a Bria, Someone, uh, um, Arabis. Yeah, someone no, but it was that, a female. That I'm pretty sure it was a woman. So I think. It yeah, was yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're like emissaries, right? Yeah, right. And yeah. they're like they can't come on land because they've grown too they're big. Too and Baldanders is one of them, kind of, or at least connected. Baldanders is connected to them in some way. Right. It's hinted that he will one day also have to go to the water. Yeah, because um, he keeps growing. Because yeah. he keeps growing, he won't he won't yeah. stop growing. And they they're in league with Vodalus? maybe right. And, and so the, I mean, it was it was kind of hinted at. I'm pretty sure. Like I think when he talks to Abaya, she said something about that. Um, yeah. So there are various. So they're like anti Altark. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. Giant green people in the water are anti Altark. Yeah. So these various factions are trying to manipulate. Severian to be on their side, it feels like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll see more of that next book. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> I have thoughts. I have feelings. I like I'm so excited. The 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 Autark, I mean, one of the one of the things one of the things I keep thinking about is how how rotten and broken down society is. Yeah. You know, like I can understand that there isn't a clear, cohesive, stable political structure because every time Severian runs into anybody in the higher levels, they they just feel like someone who's waiting to die. Yeah. You know, like the like I forget her name, but the woman in the in the clock courtyard in the beginning of yeah. Shadow of the Torturer. 
Um, yeah. You know, and all of, all of these things, it just feels like it's such a corrupt, fallen apart, decrepit society that's just basically waiting for the sun to turn off. Yeah. yeah. Um, Even Severian in, in Claw of the Conciliator executes a woman who he realizes is innocent, essentially. Yeah. Um, what was it? Mar. Actually. Yeah, Marina but, or something like but that. The system yeah. demands it. But this other woman had framed her and, and, yeah. and seemed to take some delight in informing Severian, I lied or whatever, you know. I, I yeah. Yeah. he was innocent, is what she says, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but Severian doesn't, I mean, sometimes he's capable of some very compassionate acts. Yeah. And then here he's like, oh, well, I did my job well, at least, you know? Yeah. <laughs> he, he did what a torturer is meant to do. Yeah. Perfect yeah. form, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Which, uh, you know, uh, now that you put it in those terms of thinking about, uh, you know, there was the, what was it? Was it during Vietnam, I think, where the military had this problem where it's like, oh, soldiers don't want to shoot other people. So they just start like conditioning soldiers to just fire on instinct, right? Mm. And, you know, Wolf, uh, uh, you know, he served in the Korean War and was heavily traumatized by that and, and suffered from PTSD for a long time. Mm. Um, and, and he said the original idea for this was a, a young man goes to war. Mm. And so I do wonder, uh, I, I, I know, I, I, I think that there's definitely a critique there, right? That uh, as humans just go through the, the motions of life, they forget that they were waiting in the waiting in the antechamber to have a meeting, and now that it's become a prison by default. And it's right. uh, I'm thinking about uh, Le Guin's novel, The Dispossessed. Uh, the 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 major mantra of that, which is the revolution must come in every generation, mm-hmm. and uh, how, basically it's, it's it's a call to mindfulness, right? And it's you know in, uh, imagine an author in the 1980s who was concerned about humanity getting into a rut that is kind of ruled over not by good moral sense but by you know the machinery of society that's weird oh wait yeah uh yeah and so uh, history it, repeats itself it does and the the glimpse that we get here of the autark he doesn't other than he seems to know exactly what's going on and he's the only one he doesn't seem to be anything like a leader yeah, like, more, more yeah. of a trickster. Yeah, yeah, totally. You yeah. never see him with in the book with anyone other than Severian. Yeah, well, in and the first trickster... book, I mean, he's in the House of Jura, but um, yeah. the only place we see him is when he sort of sneaks up on Severian. Yeah, yeah. and well, it, gives what are the hint. trickster's job? A trickster's job is to remind humanity what it means to be human uh, in, in Jungian psychology. Yeah. That, that, that's the goal of a trickster. And so, you know, Philip has already commented, it seems like is Severian being tested or even prepared for something? Yeah. Uh, and if the, so like, is the Autarch's job really to govern or is the Autarch's, Autarch's job something else entirely? Mm. Yeah. Again, I'll have more things to say about that in, for the next two volumes. Yeah, and I mean, in this, awesome. in this one already, it's kind of clear that he, he knows Severian is with Vodalus and he supports yeah. it. Yeah, Basically. but he also says, "And you should work for me too." And Severian's like, "Yes, I work for both sides." Yeah, brilliant. I have totally sworn my entire life to Vodalus <laughs> because he gave me a coin when I was a kid. But you also seem okay. Also, yeah. he says, "Because I saved his life, and when you save someone's life, you you become super you own invested." Them. In yeah. Them. yeah, 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 yeah. Well, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> we shall find out. We exactly. Shall. Next month. Uh, yeah. What is it? Citadel. Citadel the yeah. Autark. No, no, no. Sword of the Lictor. No, Citadel Sword the Lictor. That's Sword right. Yeah. Citadel's yeah. last one. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. All right. I'm excited. Yeah. That's going to be fun. Maybe yeah. we can, uh, we can, in the next couple of days, already schedule the next one that we don't have such a long, a long gap. Yeah. Yeah. I just need to get through the first week of May and then. I'm taking a break. Yeah. All right. Sounds cool. good. Excellent. Right. Thanks, guys. It has See been you. another enlightening conversation. I've really enjoyed yeah. it. Um, it's uh, it's it's nice to have some maybe clear ideas about the what the fuckery that's going on. <laughs>
<laughs> if you have those, I, I'm envious. <laughs> Yeah, it's slightly clearer in some places. I would say maybe, sort of, probably not really. Yeah, but but it's probably yeah. healthier than an acid trip. So yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, back when I used to do acid, it was a lot of fun, but it was obviously something with an expiry date on it. Where like, I'm gonna stop doing this eventually. <laughs> I'm not. Just I'm not gonna keep doing this forever. Now, you'll be yeah, good. exactly. That's why I read books like this because I miss acid trips. <laughs> there you go. Oh. Joking. I don't miss House of Trips at all, but I'm, I, it was an interesting experience at the time. Oh. But yeah, now we've got Gene Wolfe instead. So yeah. At least, at least uh, it seems like all three of us are still enjoying it. So it's fun talking about it too. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's totally bizarre to read and it's, it's interesting and bizarre to talk about, but I'm, I am enjoying them. So good. That's the main thing. Yeah. yeah. Cool, guys. All right. Then I will see you next time. Thanks very Sounds much good. for the chat. Thank you. Ciao. Bye.